Thank you. Thank you. Uh, how do you follow the inventor of the internet? Well, it seems you bring on a Formula One world champion, of course. Uh, <laughs> glad to see you all uh, stick around. Uh, Nico, uh, Mariana and Franz, um, thanks all for joining us. Great that we have uh, such a diverse panel uh, and should be make for a really interesting uh, discussion on leadership. So I'm going to start with a quick fire answer from all of you, if you will. In one word, what is the key attribute of a great leader? Franz, let's start with you. I think the one word is, is example. Leading by example, setting the right example, and this way, making sure that people can follow you the right way. Example, very good. Mariana? For me, it's being connected. I mean, the world is connected, fully connected, and you really need to connect with your team. Yeah, Anika? I'll go for a different one. I'll go for empathy. Empathy? Empathy for the people you're working with. I like that. Example, connected, <laughs> and em empathy. Um, yeah. Great, great advice there. Nico, let's start with you. Uh, of course, to get to the top of F1, you need to be a leader, um, someone that the whole team kind of looks up to. Did you always feel that responsibility when you entered the car? Yeah, so first of all, hi, everybody. It's great to be here in Lisbon. Uh, it's very, very special, this event. Awesome. I'm very, very proud to be here on stage. And yes, I was very, very privileged because I think I witnessed some of the most impressive leadership ever in the world of sports. The Mercedes Formula One team, is now breaking all the records. It's the fifth world championship in a row, destroying the opposition in a way that the sport has never, ever seen before. So it's really, really phenomenal. And all this, a lot of this is down to great leadership. And I, I was able to see this myself with my own eyes. And so I learned so much, it was incredible. Our leader is called Toto Wolf, and a phenomenal job he does really. And, and his, um, his style is really a, a style of empowering, yeah? It's not dictatorship. It's really the opposite, empowering his employees uh, to rise up and giving them trust. And this was really beautiful to see how this can elevate an entire organization. Yeah, and Mariana, picking up what Nico says there, yes. it, 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 when you're building to something, you know, often there's times of huge stress. That Nico must have experienced that in a car. How important is kind of strong leadership, you know, in stressful situations? I mean, leadership. Uh, it's, it's very important as of today because we are living in a changing world mm. where many factors are affecting the way of interacting in the people, in the teams. Technology has a strong effect on our business models. We have uh, IOTs, we have uh, artificial intelligence, we have digital twins. By the way, uh, we have a digital twin of a Formula One car, I'm coming and I to will invite I'm you. Coming to visit <laughs> after Be careful, this. we can make a digital twin of you also. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, Franz, we'll, we'll, we'll go into more detail in, in terms of technology in a moment. How much of leadership, Franz, is, is inbuilt, and how much can you learn? We, we hear that the phrase natural born leader. Is, is there such a thing? I think there are, as in everything, I'm, as in sports, as in any other occupation, there are natural talents, people who, who were sort of start out at a higher level. But I think the important part is focusing on how we can all improve. There's room for improvement for everybody. And probably building on your strengths, trying to reinforce what you already do quite well, is probably the best way to do that. Uh, okay, so a good general overview of what leadership is. Let's delve a bit more into uh, kind of leadership in the, in the modern world, because more often than not, technology equals power. Uh, Mariana, uh, what has been the impact of the digital revolution on leadership and how has tech really changed what is needed, what is necessary from a leader? I mean, technology has changed completely the leadership style. Today you have big data flowing around, you have the necessity to make quickest decisions, and this changes the role of the, of the, of the leader. This new uh, interaction or technology affects the business models and the team needs to understand what is going on outside. And the role of the leader is to guide the team under this uncertainty and this is a change in roles. Mm -hmm. And this is what is for me is the most important the role uh, on today's environment. Yeah, so I, I add one more point to that. Yeah. With technology taking such a big, big role and you're all here for that as well. Um, what I saw in my sport as well was all the engineers, they got so dug into their technology, their numbers, their computers, yeah? And they sometimes forgot that actually in the car there's a human being driving, yeah. yeah? Just as your colleagues are also all human beings and we have emotions, we have fears, needs. Mm. And I think it's very, very important to not lose sight of that. And uh, Nico, how did you approach that? Because, you know, how do you make sure you know enough 
but you don't need to know everything. How do you trust the team around you, uh, but you know, kind of go into a car, just taking what you need to know rather than everything? Um, that's a, that's a, I mean, that's a very important thing for leadership, I think, is to learn to learn to focus, learn to trust other people, and really use your energy for stuff that you can uh, that is in your control, yeah, and the stuff that you're good at. And I think that's also that was very very important in F1, um, the matter of focusing. Yeah, it's really so crucial for having success. Yeah. So education, of course, plays into all of this uh, kind of a changing future of education. What has been uh, the impact of this digital revolution, if you will, uh, on learning, Franz? I think it's been a very positive impact in at least three ways. So it's accessibility. There's today many more people than in any other moment in history that actually have access to great types of education, to lots of knowledge that's out there in great formats. And it comes also with affordability. That's the second dimension. So you can today connect to, listen into, sign up to most educational programs that are largely for free in a way that was never done before, and quality also. Because if you think of education as something that has to do with transmitting knowledge, working on some practical skills, and also on attributes, personal attributes, certainly the knowledge part is very easy to transmit now technologically, much easier than before, mm -hmm. and that means you can also focus, put more time on practical skills, skills development and also on how you approach things as a leader, how you think about things. So in other words, it's improved quality by focusing the quality time on the difficult aspects also. So how can we equip kind of the, the next generation of lead leaders uh, with this kind of knowledge and the capabilities right. uh, when they have to confront, you know, a world that could be dominated by AI, say? I think in different ways. So there is, there's a part of knowledge about technology that you need to have. You don't need to know all the details unless you are programming and somehow in the world of algorithms, which is an important field, of course, but will be minority, I guess. But you need to know, broadly speaking, how it works, because you need to be good at interacting with expert systems, somehow machine-powered expert systems, so that you can reinforce whatever those systems give you as a feedback and ask the right questions going back and forth. And then there's also a question of, okay, as technology becomes more powerful, about the implications of that technology and how to guide it in the right way. You know, every technology, every powerful technology can help a lot, but also can be a problem. So you need to think of the ethical implications. You need to be able to decide, is this the right thing to do right now at this moment in this organization or not? So I think these three aspects. Nika. Franz, may I jump in? Sure. You have seen so many books in your life. What is the number one book on leadership that you would recommend to all of us uh, to go away from today and order on Amazon and, and read? Well, as a very recent book, I'm not saying it's, it's uh, the, the most recent one that comes to mind is actually a book by the chairman of Nokia, uh, Risto Silasma. I'm not sure whether Are he's you here. Sure that's a good idea? He, it's he, kind of gone the wrong way. Precisely not. He talks about how you take a company when it's down there and bring it up again to new heights <laughs> in a very interesting way. So okay. a record, little so book recommendation. Called? What is it called? It's, um, it's called, um, let me think of what it's, what it's called. I have to think about <laughs> okay, it. Okay, don't worry, we'll but, he, we'll he find it. but Nico, he only, he only wrote one book, so you, you <laughs> we'll find it. We'll find it. <laughs> um, no doubt everyone's looking that up. Um, uh, Nico, it, with such rapid advances in technology, how difficult is it to keep up? For example, you've been away from racing, what, for two years? If you kind of went back into it now, would everything completely change? How would you uh, kind of approach that? So I do TV work at Formula One races, and I catch myself going there, <laughs> not having a single clue about what's going on anymore, because the world moves so fast. But what I've done is I have some friends in the, in the business who are the absolute experts day to day. So I always make sure to set aside like uh, a yeah. half an hour or one hour when I get there and I deep dive with him into all the different topics to really get myself back up yeah. to speed, yeah. Yeah, it is a changing world. It's an uncertain times in a lot of ways in the world, Mariana. How should leaders approach decision-making amid such uncertainty, such change in the world at the moment? I mean, the, this, is, this is one of the points that changed dramatically in the last years because we come from a hierarchical structure where the boss used to decide everything and the rest of the team concentrates on executing. And today, you have to take decisions in different levels in the organization. And how, how are you able to get this? The only way is if you empower people. Mm. And if you empower people and let them decide. But empowering and decision come with responsibility. 
And this is when in Siemens, one of our main pillars is the ownership culture. And what does it mean, ownership culture? That you act as if it were your own company. And I'm going to tell you, when you place this question in, in discussions uh, on the table, the content of the discussions change completely, and the attitude of the people deciding change completely, because you feel the owner of your own company. Franz, do you want to pick up uh, on this point, this, this kind of this uncertain world, you right. know? Right. So I, I think, first of all, we, we have to see that there is a lot of change and uncertainty because we're doing so well in the world. There is uncertainty because the economy is doing so well. There is uncertainty because there is entrepreneurial spirit. There are new companies that are being created that are better than the old ones, and that's why we see so much change. So it's change actually as a good thing. If we don't like it, you know, you don't have change in a, in a planned uh, communist economy. That's, that's a safe place to be in. So to give this a little bit of a positive spin, I'm saying change is actually good because it means we're doing well. Yeah. But then, of course, it's a challenge because you need to deal with new information coming in. Things are yeah, changing every day. And probably the only way to deal with this, embrace it and say, this is good. Actually, this is positive. And let's see how based on new information that comes in, in a very consistent way, you adapt, you think about new things all the time and basically declare it a good thing rather than being, you know, tr trying to fight it in one way. But then, you know, what about stability? How important is stability to kind of building success, Mariana? You know, in a changing world, it seems like there's no stability anywhere for people. Of course, you need, to, you need to have a stability to keep your business running. Uh, but you really need to be aware that you need to transform the way of acting in business, that probably what it was valid in the past is not longer valid in the future. And this is what, for example, now we are investing in the Siemens campus in Berlin, Innovation Campus, which is an ecosystem. Siemens will invest $600 million in an open ecosystem where we bring together working, innovation, living, and learning experience. And I think that this is the way to move forward when you still have a stability, but in a different way. Mm. And this is what we really need to be open in order to embrace the future. Yeah. And Nico, this, you know, pick up on that. How important is it to develop like this culture, uh, uh, you know, a culture of spirit and, and everyone pushing in the same direction, you know, in a group, for example, in Mercedes, how, do, how important was that kind of culture of, of, of all fighting for the same cause? Well, it's the most important thing as a leader to give everybody who's working with you one very, very clear and simple purpose. Yeah. Uh, what are we all fighting for? And that's so, so important. Otherwise, everybody goes in different directions and nobody, nobody understands what they're doing. But it's also one of the most difficult things to do. Yeah, what, what do you stand for as a brand, as a company? Um, we, used, we used something which I'm sure in the business school you will not teach, which was use an enemy to motivate yourself. <laughs> and uh, that's not often the right way to do it, but we had the Red Bull, uh, the Red Bull can as our, or the Ferrari car as our big motivator in the factory. Like, we need to destroy these, these, yeah. these guys. Um, and, it, it worked because, I mean, it was like cheering and yeah, let's do it and, and everything. So that was one way that worked pretty well for us. Sure. But at the same time, you need to bal balance it with an, with an altruistic uh, uh, purpose right. as well, yeah, which is inspire millions of fans around the world with, with our approach to racing, with our passion for racing. Mm -hmm. So we had these two different, uh, one, uh, one ego yeah. and one altruistic um, uh, purpose that we built up as a company and it was incredible to see everybody unite in this force yeah, and drive forward beautiful and and that's what makes it easy then for people to stay long and work long hours sometimes yeah if they have this very pure purpose it all becomes easier I, I love and that. also also for the families at home yeah. to then understand better why uh, the dad is or the or the mom the mom is working so hard so everything just, just comes together. I, I love that image of a dartboard, you throwing darts at a, a Ferrari logo or something like it that. Worked, it worked, it <laughs> worked. Any other techniques, you can, uh, Franz, in terms of building a, a group spirit, a team spirit? No, I think, well, of course, motivation, motivation is, is the key, no? And there's, there's different things you can do. And I guess there's also a motivation more short term on a specific event and a specific race or even one season. And there's also the long run kind of motivation, no? Sort of why do you exist as an organization that is very important. That's sort of the second dimension that Nico alluded to. No? And I think yeah. that's something that precisely as things change more quickly and as you need to sort of focus on changing competitors or enemies or whatever you want to consider them, 
precisely you need to be very clear about, okay, in the long run, where do you actually want this organization to go? So what are the values you want to be associated with? What's the kind of work you want to do? What's the kind of atmosphere you want to have in your company? Because that's sort of, you know, the, the, the common melody that's, that's sounding while, while you do everything and that you draw energy from. I, I need to throw into something. I have read the most incredible book for my life, actually recently, called Building a Story Brand. Yeah, which fits perfectly into our topic right now. Please go and read it. I promise you will not, you will not, uh, um, how do you say? You will uh, uh, not, uh, well, uh, you'll be happy Certainly about it. Enjoy it yeah. I promise. Um, Building a Story Brand by we, Donald, we, we Donald Miller. Rather you know than talk no. on leadership, we should, we should have done a book club. Maybe yeah. that's one for next year. Um, <laughs> Nika, I want to speak to you about competition. Imagine, if you will, you had two very dominant leaders in the same team but both aiming to be better than the other one. Just imagine. Uh, how that do you make was sure, a recipe for disaster? <laughs> how, seriously, how do you make sure that that, that that works? Yeah, so there, that was again something that they did incredibly well in our team in terms of leadership. Yeah, two uh, two guys trying to destroy each other more or less in the team. And the most important thing was to remain neutral as a leader. Yeah, and do not take sides, because as soon as you take sides it creates a, a volcano because then the other guy will start to feel neglected. He, he fights back and it just creates a total mess. So that really was one of the key ingredients um, as a leader to remain neutral. And even, even there, he empowered us to sort of take responsibility. And he explained to us, guys, you have 1,500 people working in the Mercedes-Benz Formula One team every single day on these two, two cars. And you guys are on track crashing. That just does not work, yeah? The families behind all these employees. So he really made, made it clear to us our responsibility and uh, let us get on with it. Okay, there was also some very, very hefty penalties uh, put into our contract with a lot of numbers, a lot of zeros at the end, <laughs> if we do crash again. Uh, but uh, aside from that, and it worked, it, it worked. It must be a tricky thing to manage in, in F1 that, you know, two drivers competing against each other, especially when you're both going for a world title. Yeah, it was uh, incredibly tricky, but in the end, it worked out. It worked out. We, uh, we understood, and, uh, and we found the necessary respect to keep going and, and not, uh, not crash every single time out there. <laughs> and a word about Lewis and how he's done this year. I mean, how, how, many, how many titles can he win, do you think? How many people do we have in the room who have watched Formula One races uh, this year? <laughs> wow, cool. That's really nice to see. Um, no, I mean, yeah, uh, Lewis Hamilton won the fifth championship this year. Phenomenal, really unbelievable job he's done and one of the greatest of all times now. Yeah, how many can he win? And he's going for Schumacher record, so yeah. uh, Schumacher, <laughs> Schumacher has seven, so very um, close. Guys, I want to speak to you about that, picking up about competition. How important is healthy competition in, in building success? How, how tricky is it to manage as well? I don't know, Marianne, I can, I can go first. I think the when Nico mentioned this example of sort of two very strong players in the same team, I thought of there were corporate examples of basically two teams getting the same task in large yeah. organizations, you know, and you sort of put them in that, you know, fish pond with, with the sharks in there and you say, okay, who, who is going to do the better job, you know, and, and that, that sometimes works, you know, it creates, of course, a very competitive environment that make collaboration very difficult, but for some difficult tasks where you really need to have solutions that are outside of the normal say boundaries of that you are maybe used to, it may actually work. You know, it can be a recipe for success. Mariana, so, I mean, in our case, we, we have different ways to promote innovation, but we, we, we have one example where I like it a lot, which is we call the speed boats, no? And, and we leave the people to create and to become creative. But one aspect that I will want to bring out of this change that we are living today and is important is to learn out of failures. And, and, and some of those speedboats are successful, but others are not. And, and the key thing is that we really need, need to learn the failure is a part of the learning process. Yeah. And at the beginning, the team used to talk about those ones as uh, projects that fail. But when you become more agile in the organization and the agility in the transformation of the organization, become genuine and, and embrace your, the way of working, the team start to take these failures and start to build on top of those failures. And you probably do not get what you originally wanted to have, but you got something different and you also create value for the company and for the society. So this is 
for me very important. I mean, That's Nico, is it, is it necessary to experience failure to, to truly lead a team successfully and, and, and win and, and deliver at the highest stage? It's one of my key ingredients why I won. Mm -hmm. I managed to understand that failure is an opportunity for me and it's a motivator mm -hmm. uh, to reach higher levels. Mm -hmm. And so again, I can only recommend to all of you to repeat over and over in your company that failure is an opportunity and it's not a bad thing. It's an opportunity to grow. Without failure, no growth. Exactly. Yeah, so it's really, it can be, of course it's tough in the short term, massively tough, but for the longer term, it's a very, very powerful positive. And so repeat that over and over and over to everybody in the company. I think that's uh, very, very crucial. Franz, is it possible to teach that? Of course. Mm -hmm. I think you can, you can, one of the things we, we have found is when you put people through experiences that connect with their prior experiences of failure or maybe of also successes, and as they reflect on that, that's actually when they learn. That's something you do, for example, in the case method. When you look at a case, you think of some important example of a business decision that was being done, you put yourself in that perspective, and it brings up your own memories, your own stories of success and failure. And that's when you really start to learn from those. Otherwise, you just have them in your memory, you don't really learn from them. So you need this reflection process that the case method can give you. Uh, less than two minutes to go. Uh, a couple more questions. Mariana, what will be the most important skills uh, to succeed in, in the future workplace? I mean, I already mentioned, be connected. I mean, it's, it's, it's essential. Uh, trust your team and, and be able to guide uh, the team and understand the new normal. Uh, if you don't understand what the world is changing and you need to act in this, under this uncertainty, uh, it will be problematic. Yeah. But this is what I will take. And, and Franz, kind of the same question to you. If there's, if there's one thing that you want uh, the audience to take away from today's session, what would that be? So I think there are some obvious skills that are needed in this changing environment that have to do with what we mentioned about ad adaptability, about learning, these kind of things. But that's sort of obvious and you need to do it. And then I think there is a, maybe a broader theme, and that connects a little bit with, with what Nico said at the beginning. Because in the end, in this society, in this workplace, where we'll be interacting a lot with technology, what really will make the difference is your ability to connect with other people, this empathy that Nico talked about, and your ability also as a leader to really look out for and look after the people that you are with. So I think that will, in the end, make the difference, taking the other part for granted, that you need yeah. to do that. And Nick, yeah, go on, Mariana, quickly. And I will add one more thing. Yeah. I mean, that I, I forgot. I mean, learning process. Learning is very important. Yeah. And, and we need to understand that what, what you learn as a vocational thing is just the first step. Then you need to be conscious that you need to keep learning all your life. And this is basic on today's. Nico, final okay. word from you. Okay, yeah, actually, it's a question. Go on. Please, Marianne. Uh, so many people out there are getting closer and closer to burnout. Mm -hmm. Yeah, numbers are growing in the world of business. I think uh, a lot of you here will be able to relate as well. Uh, I've been there myself in, mm -hmm. the, in the past. What are you doing as a leader to re reduce that, reduce the number of burnouts in your company and people uh, getting close to burnout? You need to be close to the people and you need, need to drive this dynamic in a way that you not overload people, but you bring the team in the agile way that we can embrace this new environment uh, working style. Is there something more specific, like letting them use their time the way they from want? From my or? point of view, the burnout comes from, this, from the fact that you're trying to capture the new environment and the traditional style. And you really need to be able to live in this, I would say, changing environment. Okay. Guys, that's all we've got time for. Sorry. We could go on and go on. I uh, hope you've enjoyed it. You've got a few book recommendations there as well. Uh, Nico, Mariana and Franz, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for listening. Thank you.